Wow. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Eugenia, for uh, that introduction. I always find it very useful to hear uh, other people describe what we do, because as chief executive and one of the co-founders of Volition, I, I always struggle to understand exactly what it is that Volition does and, and, and what we are. And the reason I find it very difficult is that the world in which we are operating, the world of fashion tech, the world in which we will be discussing, uh, the, the topic we'll be discussing all day is moving so fast and so so rapidly that I find it very difficult to understand the types of conversations that I'll be having with our brands, um, which are all brands in the luxury, the fashion, and the beauty space. I, I struggle to know what those conversations will be in six months' time. And when I look back over the last eight years that we've been operating, I, I struggle also to see the piece of string that joins all of the conversations that we've had over those eight years and has brought us to where we are now. Some people call us creative technologists. Um, the Financial Times in London recently described us as what would happen if Willy Wonka did fashion tech, which I think is probably a, a compliment. I still need to look a little deeper into that. Um, but a lot of our clients come to us because they believe that we have an interesting notion, an interesting idea on what innovation is and where retail is going over the next one to five to 20 years. And I'm always struck by how innovation is a very, very relative term. Um, your idea of innovation may be different to mine. Louis Vuitton's idea of innovation may be very, very different to, say, Chanel or to Uniqlo. And the Boston Consultancy Group, every year, they uh, issue a list of the 50 most innovative companies in the world. None of my clients, the clients that you see up here, none of those would ever make it onto the list. In terms of retail, Amazon is always on there. Sometimes fast retail group, the Uniqlo crew, they get on there. But Basically, the kind of clients that I typically talk to would not get onto that list of 50 most innovative companies, even if it expanded to 100 or even 1,000 most innovative companies in the world. One of our clients, Chanel, has uh, recently been fated in the luxury world because it's thinking about getting into e-commerce. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I think e-commerce is probably not the most innovative of technologies anymore, maybe five years ago. So, I could spend the next 20 minutes talking about some of the less innovative projects that we do for brands such as this. But I think because we're talking about the future of fashion tech and where it's going, what I'd rather do is talk to you about uh, some more innovative ideas and some more innovative projects. But before we do that, I, I just want to sort of flag a few concerns that I have about the way that um, people are, um, are, are moving with technology now. And... They fit into three different areas. The, the first concern I have is that I think we need a revolution in the way that uh, people react and work and, and integrate their daily lives with technology. I'm talking about user experience, and I think user experience is one of the most interesting areas um, of the future, and by the future, I mean the next six months to a year. And I think one of the great legacies that Steve Jobs left us is that through the iPhone, he reduced the distance between people and technology. Um, but on your smartphones, I imagine you all have smartphones and tablets, you'll have a whole series of apps on those devices, but none of those apps come with an instruction manual of how to use them. You work out the right types of technology for you by the same way that we all learn as human beings, by exploration, by discovery, but also by making mistakes. And making mistakes is a very, very important part of the learning process. But in the retail sense, it's a very, very big ask I would suggest, uh, to expect a, a consumer to walk up to a piece of technology and, and use it and, 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 and work with it if they're really not at all sure about how it works and they don't want to look like an idiot in front of their, their fellow shoppers. And if you type in retail innovation into YouTube, for example, you'll see lots of wonderful technology, but most of it requires a salesperson grabbing a person, a consumer, over to a piece of technology and showing them how, it use, how it's used. It's not intuitive enough at the moment. And secondly, I, I think a lot of technology that I see in store is just simply not good enough to get into that store. I don't think it's helping the brand. I think it's hurting the brand. And there are lots of, I, lots of examples such as this, where this poor woman's trying to try on clothing. But it's too much of a computer game and not enough of retail. You know, in my mind, if because uh, I'm an ex-retailer, if a real person walks into a real shop and picks up a real pair of trousers and walks into a, a real fitting room and tries them on, they want to look cool, they want to look interesting, they want to look glamorous, sexy. And if they don't, no one in this room, 
Crikey. No one in this room will buy that piece of clothing. You will put the clothing down and you will walk out of that shop. You will not purchase it. So for me, that's where the bar is set. We, the, the technology in a store must at least do that. And if it doesn't do that, then what is, what is the point? And just thirdly, although I'm a massive fan of VR, I'm not totally convinced about VR and computer screens and, and TVs and all of this technology in a, in a retail space because I, I just feel there's a danger that it's putting a barrier between people and the product. In the end, people need to walk out with a real handbag or a, a real pair of shoes. And I just find it wrong, potentially, that, that you walk into a store and, and the first thing that happens is that you look at an iPad and you start looking down here when you should be admiring the beauty of the architecture or looking around at all of the product. Here, I could be having that conversation sitting on a bench in a park, but I'm in a retail store, so I would rather celebrate retail and celebrate that space. People talk about the fact that we're now moving into this area of the fourth industrial revolution, and, and I'm very, very interested in that. The first industrial revolution used the power of water and steam to mechanize production. The second industrial revolution used electricity to drive scale. So now you had uh, car assembly plants in America making hundreds and hundreds of cars. The third industrial revolution in the 1970s used the power of digital and electronics to automate production. So now it was robots making cars and pushing those off the car assembly plants. People are talking about the fact that we're moving into the fourth industrial revolution, and the fourth industrial revolution is categorized and this is the interesting bit, by this fusion, this blurring between the physical world, the digital world, and the biological world. The human element is going to become increasingly important in the world of digital. And one of the people that we are currently working with at the moment that's trying to explore, I, I should warn everybody that this this kind of fourth industrial revolution area does include some quite unusual but maybe interesting people. And this is one of them, who's Professor Brian Warwick. We're doing a project with him at the moment. And he's a wonderful, perfectly normal man. He's happily married. He's got two absolutely beautiful children. And he's wired his body into the Internet of Things. So you can see he's wearing this cuff here. This cuff has been wired into his nervous system of his hand. And he can move his real hand in his laboratory at the University of Birmingham. And in America, in another university, a robotic hand will move as his hand moves. He's connected the two over the internet. He's also in the middle of a project where he's putting a skin graft on his arm. And his wife, who clearly loves him very, very much indeed, is doing the same. And as he touches his skin graft, wherever he is in the world, she can feel his touch on her arm. Uh, it's quite an interesting space. I said there are some unusual people working with, within it, but they're trying to work out how to humanize digital. Digital doesn't just stop, and then there's a gap, and then there's a real product at the end of it. It's a seamless journey all the way through. So I'd like to show you two or three of the ways in which we are trying to help our clients um, move into the fourth industrial revolution. And the bit that I really want to focus on just for the next 10 minutes is this area of big data and using big data to... Uh, to be intelligent, to make brands smart, and to understand more about themselves and more about their customers, but to do it in an artistic and a cultural way that draws people towards installations and not pushes them away. So I don't know whether um, in Spain you know the brand List. List is one of the, uh, the first of the UK fashion tech startups to generate real scale. They are like net porter they are like ASOS, and they are only an online, uh, sorry, an online fashion e-commerce player. <coughs> But they're also a little like uh, Uber, which, as you know, is the world's largest taxi company but owns no taxis, or Airbnb, which is the world's largest real estate company but owns no real estate. List own no product. They're a portal, and they have thousands of brands selling all of their product on this portal. The brands have the responsibility of updating all of their data on the List website. So all of that hard, hard work, all that housekeeping, it's all done by the brands. List don't have to do that. If you buy from List, they take your money, but the brands have to do all of the fulfillment, all the shipping, they've got to deal with all the returns. So what List don't have is that huge warehouse outside Heathrow Airport with all of that cost of stocking and management. They haven't any of that, they just take money. And they're selling about 60 to 80 million dollars every month, they claim. Most of that's going to the brands, they take a commission on that. When they were five, 
um, when they reached their fifth birthday, they had a birthday party for their investors, one or two celebrities, and some journalists in the Hoxton Cube, which is an art gallery, famous art gallery in the east of London. And they wanted something in that space that talked about the power and the scale that they had achieved. And we put this in. Now, this is a piece of real-time big data art. And when we spoke to their uh, web people, what we realized was that there are now so many brands talk pushing all of their data at list, talking to the list servers, that 30,000 objects change every single second. So that's new product coming on, old product going off, and a lot of stock management in the middle. So is that brand's product in that color and that size still available? All of that data gets pushed, 30,000 items every second at list. And what we did is we borrowed it or stole it, maybe hacked it, that sounds bad, diverted it through this visualization. So here are the brands, and here's a data point flowing from the brand to the, this ring here, which is the color of the item and then into the middle, which is the price of the item, and then it collapses into the middle. When it hits that point, we release it, and it's updated in real time on the list server. It's much, much easier to understand through a film. <coughs> so here it is working. Whoops. You can see the data flowing around. And what looks like a, a huge stream of data, um, or, or a hose pipe, like water flowing, is actually thousands and thousands of items. Each dot is one individual item being updated in real time on that server. And because data takes nine seconds to go from the brand to the color and into the price and then into the middle, and that's 30,000 every second, that's about 270,000 items are being shown at any one moment on this site and uh, on, on, on this projection. And what is interesting is that this suddenly realized that they now had a tool for trend. They could see which brands were selling what product. Is it, is it clothes? Is it boots? Is it dresses or skirts or jackets or raincoats or shirts or tights? What is it? And now they're taking all of this data, which is 9 billion bits every year, aggregating it, and they're selling it back to the brand and they're making more money now from big data than they are from fashion. And fashion is now just an excuse to get access to big data. It's big data where the real value for this company lies. So that was um, big data at about 270,000 bits per second. We, we were then very, very interested to see whether we could take big data and merge it into the world of, of fashion. So I'm going to show you three, um, three of our wearable big data projects. And the first one came up which is this one, which is a rain palette. Uh, it's about four years old, and um, I, one of my other jobs I do is uh, um, I work with two courses at Central St. Martins, and one of the courses, Material Futures. There's a student there called, Di or there was a student there called Dahir Sun who was experimenting with um, uh, dyes, uh, reactive dyes. <coughs> and I was speaking at a conference in Paris on the future city, and I was having a dinner with one of our clients who's a a large French luxury brand that I cannot name because their lawyers absolutely, completely, utterly terrify me and keep me awake at night. But come up and have a chat to me later, and I might whisper it in your ear. Shh. But um, at this conference, there was an architect who was talking about the future city. And the problems that he had with building it is that he could design these incredible wide open boulevards, great places for people to live and to work. But the problem is, is that infrastructuralists come along and clutter it up with park benches and CCTV cameras and street lights and, and, and bike racks and all the kind of paraphernalia of urban living. <clears throat> and our client was saying, well, that's interesting, because in Paris, there are 1,600 boxes that measure air quality stuck on all the streets. And we've always been very interested in how technology in one sector can leap across and inform or disrupt or, or change a completely different sector. And we wanted to see whether we could use fashion to figuratively, not literally, but figuratively remove the need for those boxes. So with this student from Central St. Martins and this brand, we created a few items of clothing that change color according to the quality of the air that you're walking through. So if you're walking down the Champs-Élysées, your clothes will go pinker and pinker and pinker. If you're walking then down the Tuileries Gardens, your clothes will go to grayer and then bluer. And every item had a little button or a cuff link that had a Bluetooth transmitter that was linked through your mobile phone back to the brand. 
Every three hours, that brand got a reading of the location and the color and has now built up a map of air quality around Paris. Not the way that Google would do it, which is we will have a fleet of cars and like a military operation, we will drive around the streets of Paris sniffing out the air. Just by people living their lives, because it's very, very difficult to build technology, but it's much, much, much more difficult to get people to change their lives to use technology. So this is just people dropping the children off at school, meeting a friend after work, going to an art gallery or walk in the park. But just by the fact of them living their lives, they have provided data points to this brand and helped um, understand or help map uh, where in Paris is a better place to live or not. But that was only one data point every three hours. And big data, I think, is a little bit more complicated than one every 30 hours. So the next year, we did this project, which again was in collaboration with um, Lauren Boker, who's a Royal College of Art student and runs a runs a, a kind of alchemy studio called The Unseen. Check her out. Um, and this was commissioned by the UK government and the British Fashion Council. And they had a theme that year of emotional well-being, of happiness, of stability. So we came up with this, which is a cape. It's a leather and ceramic cape. And it's, when it's worn on the catwalk, it scans your mind every single second and across three different data points and learns about how you're feeling. So it can understand whether you're happy or sad or lonely or miserable or euphoric, stressed, and then changes colors um, according to how you're feeling. So the colors change and moderate depending on how your brain is working. And there's a film which is, again, easier to understand. Um, so this is the sound of somebody's brain actually being scanned in real time. Um, here's the piece. And these are the metrics across which we scan. And it's the fusion of those three metrics taken every single second that then starts generating the colors coming through in different areas. And we did this piece for two reasons. The first is personal. Um, a very, very good friend of mine, one of my best, best friends, had a stroke. Um, he's paralyzed from the neck down. Uh, he can't talk. He can't move. And we wanted to see whether we could give a voice where the fashion could help give voice to people that, that aren't able to communicate in other ways. But, but also, it came out as um, Google Glass, if anyone remembers what Google Glass is or was. But they had a video that was promoting Google Glass. And in that video, there was a guy going on a date, blind date, with his glasses. And when he met his date, he could use face recognition to check out his partner's previous boyfriends and read the reviews of her from those previous boyfriends. And we were just not totally convinced that this was the right use of big data. We just wanted to get into this conversation about pri privacy, because a lot of people that wore the cape felt very, very self-conscious um, of literally showing their heart on their sleeve. They didn't want people to see how they felt. Or, but, but quite happily, two hours, later, two hours earlier, they were posting to their Facebook network that they were having a bad day or they were feeling kind of great. So we just wanted to talk about that. And just finally, <clears throat> I'll show you a little bit about our last, or our most recent project, which is Dress for Our Time, um, in collaboration with Professor Helen Storey, who's a professor of sustainable fashion at the London College of Fashion. And this came about because um, the United Nations were concerned that at the climate change, <clears throat> excuse me, the climate change conference in Paris last year, uh, on the one hand, there would be politicians and industrialists saying that there is no such thing as climate change. And on the other hand, there would be different politicians and environmentalists saying there is, by the way, and it's bad, and we're all going to hell. And the two would kind of clash and collide because no one really trusts politicians to, to, to make the big calls that will make things better. And if you believe in climate change, you can't have compromise. You've got to fix and solve it. So the UN is interested in looking at other channels of communication to get the real messages around climate change and with this piece, uh, refugee movements, to you, and that you will start to, to use that data to put pressure on your politician for a real change. They wanted to do something in fashion, and I got really worried about the link between fashion and refugee movements, because you could argue that fashion might be seen as being Naomi Campbell sipping champagne in a, in a Parisian fashion show, and that's a world away from pain and suffering and misery on the Syrian-Turkish border. So we wanted the dress to have a resonance. So the dress here is actually a United Nations refugee tent. You can see the guy ropes down the side here. 
Um, and it had been damaged in a storm and came out of a Syrian refugee camp. It had housed real Syrian families, um, and, and therefore the fabric itself had an emotional resonance. In terms of the technology, every day there are 42,500 new refugees. That's three new refugees every single second. And the dress itself is wired into United Nations um, data banks. And every time a new refugee registers, 15 seconds later, we get that data in the dress. The dress is hooked into the Internet of Things. And you probably can't see, but along the bottom here, there are countries. And three new refugees appear every second. And they start to rise up and rise up and rise up. And the dress fills up like a reverse Tetris over 24 hours with fashion, with a design. But the design is created by real people looking for a better life. The dress has been on a journey um, to symbolize the journey that refugees are taking, um, looking for safety. And it started out, started out at St Pancras railway station, um, <clears throat> talking to politicians and industrialists as they got on the train and went to the climate change conference, reminding them of their obligation to humanity, to you and to me. It went to United Nations headquarters in Geneva. It uh, opened the Glastonbury Music Festival. Uh, a singer played wearing it. It's been to the Science Museum. And at the Science Museum, uh, the Science Museum didn't believe that uh, people would understand a dress that was changing so slowly that it was only working over a 24-hour cycle. So we had to completely change the visualization. So what you're seeing here <coughs> is this is the entire year's worth of um, refugee migration heading to the countries where they end up. And every 20 seconds, we add in another 60 new refugees. So it's built up over the course of a year. So it, it's, it's talking about, there's about 62, just under 62.5 million data points here. And you can see them starting to describe the, uh, the journey that, that these refugees are taking. And so, uh, sorry, it's quite dark, but she walked in off the street, she walked through the Science Museum, and she ended up here with the visualization working. And because the exhibition went on for six weeks, um, this is the static version operating here. So just in conclusion, um, Holition, we are, whatever we are, we are eight years old. And, and as one of my co-founders rem reminded me earlier this year, that means that we started before the iPhone was launched, before Twitter was launched, and when Facebook had 1.2 million users and you had to have an academic email address to become part of their network. So we started right at the cusp for our clients, luxury, fashion, and beauty, of where, where all this digital stuff is going. And it took my clients a long, long time to, to get going. One of the very, very first meetings we ever had was with uh, another very well-known individual in luxury, and I sat in his office looking over Place Vendôme, and he said, Jonathan, I love what you guys are trying to do, but until somebody can prove to me that the internet will still be here in three years, we're not going to go off and do anything mad and crazy and digital. So we saw luxury and fashion and beauty suddenly get very, very digital, and that's kind of where they've been. And the pendulum has swung very, very digital, too far digital, I think, in my own personal view. But I'm a firm believer in Newton's third law of motion, that every action has an opposite and equal reaction, and I can feel the pendulum starting to come back into this area of the fourth industrial revolution, where we're talking about humanizing technology, creating digital empathy, joining people and technology together. It's not just about an entirely digital experience. We as human beings crave physical experience too. And I was really gratified to, see, uh, to read a blog recently by Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, and he was talking about this incredible thing he had discovered called a book. You hold it, you read it, you turn pages, you can have a relationship with it, it feels permanent. And I was really, really sort of um, uh, heartened to, um, to read that. So just in con conclusion, the very, very best technologies, the ones that will really work tomorrow and in, and in the future, will be so profound that they will disappear. You know, they will weave themselves into the way that we, that we operate, to the way that we work, to the way that we live. And the irony is that as they do that, they will help learn, teach us and expand what it means for us to be human beings. Thank you very much indeed.
Maravilloso. Muchísimas gracias, Jonathan. Ahora hay posibilidad de hacer preguntas a Jonathan en español, en el idioma que queráis, porque va a tener traducción, me parece un lujo haber retenido aquí. Somos unos privilegiados que estamos ahora mismo aquí dentro de este auditorio. No sé si alguna persona se quiere animar, porque si no lo hago yo, ¿eh? yo soy mi preguntona. No veo, no veo si hay alguna mano levantada. A mí me gustaría, Jonathan, que nos contases cuáles son las tecnologías del futuro. Exactamente cuáles, mm. las que más demandan las empresas. Ok, so, I mean, the question is around what are the sort of technologies um, in the future that will impact us. I, I put that chart up about the fourth industrial revolution and there were lots of broad areas about, uh, in, uh, that, that I think are very, very interesting. Um, And, and I guess what we would do is that we would look at some, and those areas were things around mixed reality. I mean, I was rude about virtual reality, but I'm very interested in it. I just don't think it's quite there yet. I was interested in areas around anticipatory intelligence. I think it's really, really powerful that as brands start to, to have better tools to understand all of our behavior, they can start to talk to us all as individuals. I'm an old-fashioned retailer, so the brands that I was working for pre-digital, it was all about talking at customers. You know, we would divide the whole world into A, B, C1, C2, Ds and Es, and that's it. But what digital has allowed brands to do is to understand that we are all profoundly individual. And by the way, as we go through our lives and even as we go through our day, we change and adapt according to our mood and the environment around us. And that allows brands potentially to, to curate products and services that are right for us by a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And I find that very interesting. I'm also very interested in this area of home production. So 3D printing, whatever that is. Um, we're currently talking to a major luxury group about about home producing, home manufacturing, and they are trying to get their minds around what is the point of a brand? What is the point of a retailer? What is the point of a shop in a world where consumers might be able to print their own clothes out in their own kitchen? What is the role of a brand in, in that environment? So when I start thinking about areas around the fourth, fourth revolution, I'm, I'm thinking about technology But actually what I'm really thinking about is how that technology will change human behavior and human reaction and consumption. And I think you know, that's what I would urge everybody here to do, is to think about the technological tools that we have today, but what does that mean for the consumer behavior of the future? Muy interesante. Thank you. Porque en Holision trabajáis con la... Ayer hablábamos un poco de esto. Con la cabeza o con el corazón? Sorry, I didn't understand. <laughs> In Holisian, how do you work with the brains or ah. with the heart? <laughs> yeah, it's a great, great question. <laughs> yeah, that's a brilliant, brilliant question. Um, we, I guess we work with the heart, um, but, but the heart's got to be driven by the brains, isn't it? I mean, in the, in the end, we're all emotional people, we're all flesh and blood, but, but, and we try and act rationally, but I, I know from, from when my first girlfriend left me that in the end, we are fundamentally emotional. But what I do think is that the conversation that we need to have is not about technology. So for us, even though we build everything that you see, everything that we do, we build entirely ourselves. We always look at technology as being the reins holding us back. You know, you all have smartphones, and when you get your new iPhone, for a few months, you're absolutely wowed by it. It's the most amazing piece of technology ever. But then you kind of think, oh, I wish it was a bit faster, or I wish it had more storage. When is the next iPhone coming out? So I, I find that technology often fundamentally disappoints eventually because it, it doesn't quite do what the brain would love it or the heart would love it to do. So we have this race between, or this fight in some ways, between the creatives at Telition who are trying to take the agency in that direction and the technology people who are kind of trying to hold it back. So. I personally feel that, that at Telition, what we are really interested in is not living in the shadow of the valley, but looking up at the mountaintop and seeing the sunshine on top of the mountain. And we want to be up there. As human beings, we want to climb mountains. And it's creativity and imagination that get us up there. So I think heart is probably where we are, but you cannot do it without the head and the brains. Muy claro. No sé si última oportunidad para preguntar a Jonathan. Hay una ah. persona que te quiere preguntar, Jonathan. Usa el translation. No. 
uh, it's a really, really good, good question. I mean, I, I'm a massive fan of VR. I'm not yet a fan of VR in the retail sense. Do I think it's where it might end up? Yes, I think there is a definite chance that it will. Um, but I always feel, it goes back to what I was saying before, I think the hardware of today holds us back. I think part of the answer to this is to really understand what is the benefit of shopping in a physical environment and what is the benefit of shopping in a virtual environment. And then, and then to think about how virtual reality can support that. Um, there's a virtual reality project that um, a brand's doing in the UK where you can wear your headset and you can walk around a shop, um, but you can do that from your sofa. I'm not convinced that I want to walk around a shop from my sofa. I, I'm more convinced that I'd rather walk into a real shop and talk to real people and pick up real product and, and try, try it on. Virtual reality in a, in a retail sense at the moment is more about experience. So I walk into a shop, I put on a headset, and, and I'm shown an amazing world, which is not about product, but about the brand. And, 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 I, and, and, and that's interesting. There is a definite need for that. But I think the challenge for VR is will it still be here in a fashion sense next year? And maybe it will, but you know, fashion by definition is completely changeable and is always looking for the next thing. Chanel doesn't show last year's clothes on this year's catwalk, it shows this year's clothes. And I think um, yeah, when I look at how fashion has used tech technology, they, they're, they're very much looking at the next thing. So it was holograms one year, but not the next. They're exploring with wearables for two, maybe three years, and, and I'm really sad to see wearables starting to fade out maybe, maybe a little bit, because brands are saying, oh, I did that last year, I want to do something else. There was a flirtation with drones at one point, they're not there. Now, definitely, there's this flirtation with VR. And I'm, and I'm not totally convinced that, that fashion brands were using, using VR. I, I, th I think VR is amazing technology, but it's really got to find its need. People talk about technology often as being a solution, looking for a problem to solve. I'm not totally sure that VR's found the problem it's trying to solve yet. When it does, Wow. Muy bien. Pues aquí lo tenemos que dejar, Jonathan. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Enjoy ha your day. Ha sido un placer, eh, tenerte aquí, un lujo. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Conversations that we've had over those eight years and has brought us to where we are now. Some people call us creative technologists. Um, the Financial Times in London recently described us as what would happen if Willy Wonka did fashion tech, which I think is probably a, a compliment. I, still need to look a little deeper into that. Um, but a lot of our clients come to us because they believe that we have an interesting notion, an interesting idea on what innovation is and where retail is going over the next one to five to 20 years. And I'm always struck by how innovation is a very, very relative term. Um, your idea of innovation may be different to mine. Louis Vuitton's idea of innovation may be very, very different to, say, Chanel or to Uniqlo. And the Boston Consultancy Group, every year, they uh, issue a list of the 50 most innovative companies in the world. None of my clients, the clients that you see up here, none of those would ever make it onto the list. In terms of retail, Amazon is always on there. Sometimes fast retail group, the Uniqlo crew, they get on there. But basically, the kind of clients that I typically talk to would not get onto that list of 50 most innovative companies, even if it expanded to 100 or even a thousand most innovative companies in the world. One of our clients, Chanel, has uh, recently been fated in the luxury world because it's thinking about getting into e-commerce. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I think e-commerce is probably not the most innovative of technologies anymore, maybe five years ago. So I, I could spend the next 20 minutes talking about some of the less innovative projects that we do for brands such as your smartphones. I imagine you all have smartphones and tablets. You'll have a whole series of apps on those devices, but none of those apps come with an instruction manual of how to use them. You work out the right types of technology for you by the same way that we all learn as human beings, by exploration, by discovery, but also by making mistakes. And making mistakes is a very, very important part of the learning process. But in the retail sense, it's a very, very big ask I would suggest, uh, to expect a, a consumer to walk up to a piece of technology and, and use it and, 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 and work with it if they're really not at all sure about how it works and they don't want to look like an idiot in front of their, their fellow shoppers. And if you type in retail innovation into YouTube, for example, you'll see lots of wonderful technology, but most of it requires a sales just this. But I think because we're talking about the future of fashion tech and where it's going, 
What I'd rather do is talk to you about uh, some more innovative ideas and some more innovative projects. But before we do that, I, I just want to sort of flag a few concerns that I have about the way that um, people are, um, are, are moving with technology now. And they fit into three different areas. The, the first concern I have is that I think we need a revolution in the way that uh, people react and work and, and integrate their daily lives with technology. I'm talking about user experience, and I think user experience is one of the most interesting areas um, of the future, and by the future I mean the next six months to a year. And I think one of the great legacies that Steve Jobs left us is that through the iPhone, he reduced the distance between people and technology. Um, but on you... Wow. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Ehendia, for... Uh, that introduction, I always find it very useful to hear uh, other people describe what we do, because as chief executive and one of the co-founders of Holition, I, I always struggle to understand exactly what it is that Holition does and, and, and what we are. And the reason I find it very difficult is that the world in which we are operating, the world of fashion tech, the world in which we will be discussing, uh, the, the topic we'll be discussing all day, is moving so fast and so, so rapidly that I find it very difficult to understand the types of conversations that I'll be having with our brands, um, which are all brands in the luxury, the fashion, and the beauty space. I, I struggle to know what those conversations will be in six months' time. And when I look back over the last eight years that we've been operating, I, I struggle also to see the piece of string that joins all of the conversations